Thanks very much, and uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, so this title is a bit broad. What I will uh, be talking about <laughs> mainly uh, comes from three uh, papers. One paper is, is, uh, has been published within the IMF uh, working paper series about a year ago. And then there are two draft papers that were shared, I think, uh, at least to the discussants. And I think they are a, a prolongation of, uh, uh, of the first one in, in different specific dimensions. Um, and maybe for those of you who uh, read French, uh, this refers also to this book uh, that was out uh, in the first quarter this year, uh, uh, written with uh, Michel Aglietta. So in this book, we, we have a very ambitious uh, and wide-ranging goal, which is to re-explain the different phases of capitalism with uh, the lens of uh, uh, political ecology, uh, with the three uh, big parts in it. One is a bit uh, conceptual or, or political philosophy, if you, if, if you want, um, trying to define what, what we call uh, um, uh, the, the, the uh, sorry because I'm, I'm not used to speak about this book in in, uh, in English, so I, I don't find the world. But but basically different phases of uh, uh, historical viability, um, and then the the core part uh, like revisits uh, these different phases uh, in the in the long uh, long uh, time period, long history, and we have last section uh, which is much more about now and what happens, uh, what's the current situation in the um, different uh, viability phases of capitalism, um, and, and which basically retakes some of those arguments that are in this uh, IMF working paper and goes a bit uh, beyond uh, also giving the example of uh, France uh, as a case study. Um, so let me, uh, let me first uh, highlight the motivation of this. Uh, last year IMF paper that's, uh, that tries to basically define uh, what's, uh, what's the political moment for uh, mitigation policies and, and, and transition policies uh, by putting the emphasis on two dimensions, the cross-border dimension and uh, the notion of mid-transition. Um, so the motivation is that uh, the transition uh, has been very much thought at the global level or at the national level, but not too much as uh, a potential uh, shift in the relations between countries on the trade side, on the economic side, social side, financial side. Uh, but because of this uh, uh, huge globalization trend that we, we have experienced in the past decades, uh, this uh, cross-border dimension is essential to understand what could be the drivers of accelerated transition or, on the contrary, uh, potential uh, bottlenecks or, or uh, political issues that could come on the on the way. Um, so, if you look at the generic uh, IPCC uh, reports, you see those kinds of uh, nice uh, uh, simulations of uh, of global transition pathways, uh, where uh, either you have the baseline as uh, the business as usual uh, trajectory or different scenarios uh, reaching more or less 1.5 degrees or, or 2 degrees. Uh, but this is also, this is this very uh, aggregated view um, uh, and, and, that, and the, the problematic of cross-border uh, impacts of such a shift, a brutal shift in a way, uh, in a very short time frame, are not really, uh, really addressed. So uh, we, we basically raise uh, five um, essential points that, uh, let's say, should be embedded in any analysis of climate or mitigation strategies, either from a country, a single country perspective or from a, a regional or global perspective. One of those trends is the relation between geoeconomic fragmentation and uh, the transition. And you've probably seen some of literature, some literature emerging around this this topic of geoeconomic uh, fragmentation. Of course, this is the um, we, we we hear every day about uh, about that. But there is a more uh, substantial link between uh, uh, transition, the, the the low carbon transition, and geo and, and geoeconomic fragmentation. That which means that 
if you don't take into account the current factors of geoeconomic fragmentation to think about uh, mitigation strategies, you miss a, 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 a very important point. But also if you don't consider how uh, um, a decarbonization strategy might generate a specific geoeconomic fragmentation by itself, you are also missing an important point. Um, the second point, which is, let's say, maybe more positive in a way, is the rise, uh, very rapid rise in renewable uh, dominance. Um, the, the, the cost uh, of, of most renewable sectors is reaching uh, threshold tipping points uh, in many uh, uh, regions of the world where basically uh, it, it becomes competitive in comparison with uh, fossil, um, fossil sectors. That's not the case every, everywhere. And this is also perceived sometimes as a risk or geopolitical risk by, by some regions in the world that would like to protect themselves against the dominance of certain countries uh, in, the, in the rise of these renewable sectors. Third point is the emergence of uh, industrial policy as a key economic policy tool. And this has started, of course, with China, which has been doing this uh, for a long time already, but then followed by uh, uh, the US with the IRA law. So it, uh, not saying that this is exactly the same approach, but it, it belongs broadly to the, uh, the notion of industrial policy. And then followed after that by uh, uh, the European uh, Union with this, their Green, uh, deal, uh, green deal Industrial Industrial Plan, Net Zero Industry Act, and a specific act on critical minerals. Uh, so different approaches to uh, industrial policies, which so far um, leave the, the rest of the world a little bit alone, uh, uh, with no uh, fiscal capacity or finance financial capacity to really follow uh, this move by the the big uh, these big three uh, uh, regions so that's the a key point also uh, that could feed back into the geoeconomic fragmentation because you could see uh, big emerging countries uh, facing uh, difficulties to uh, uh, follow uh, the industrial policies of the uh, uh, china or the western world uh, and then saying, okay, then uh, the transition is not for us. Um, then there is the question of uh, a high, high inflation regime in the transition. So we've, we've been experiencing a phase of high inflation uh, that was uh, supply driven. This is now uh, coming down slowly, but you can think that the, the, the transition itself or an accelerated transition will create uh, similar kinds of supply driven uh, uh, inflation mechanisms because of bottlenecks in the restructuration of the uh, supply chains uh, to be able to reduce uh, emissions on time. So this is another factor that uh, belongs to this, uh, what we call this mid-transition period. And finally, uh, the ecological crisis, of course, is exacerbating the previous factors and make, make them more uh, difficult. So let me just look very briefly into uh, each one of those. Here, I just I don't want to elaborate more uh, uh, on, on geoeconomic fragmentation. I, I will show an, an illustration later on the, in the case of uh, critical minerals. Uh, this comes from uh, another IMF paper that was the first, uh, at least in, uh, in those uh, multilateral institutions, uh, to, to start fully uh, um, uh, confronting with uh, this, uh, this problematic of uh, of geoeconomic fragmentation from the perspective of an institution that's supposed to defend a, a global uh, multilateral uh, order. Um, on the, uh, the, the question of the rise of renewable dominance, uh, and the usual graph that maybe you, you've, you've all seen is th this one comes from the, the IPCC, then you have different uh, studies uh, looking at different regions uh, in the world, uh, but uh, th they show basically that uh, the cost of uh, photovoltaics, onshore wind, offshore wind, solar power, and even batteries for uh, uh, electric vehicles uh, is going down at the same time as adoption is, uh, is, uh, is increasing uh, uh, at an exponential scale. So there is a bit of a of a joint dynamic between more diffusion, faster diffusion of those uh, technologies, uh, so more adoption and the reduction of cost, uh, up to the point where uh, it becomes um, on a par with uh, uh, alternative or, or with existing fossil uh, uh, technologies. 
So tipping points have been crossed uh, in China, in Europe, more slowly in, in the US. On, on, on solar, on solar uh, photovoltaic, it seems that the tipping point is global. So there are different uh, reasons of adoption and diffusion of those uh, uh, technologies. But this is the uh, more, um, let's say, uh, positive trend. Now, there are reactions, as I, I was saying before, uh, depending on where the, your country or where, where the region is in the, in the global supply chain of those uh, technologies. And that's a feedback loop, in a way, uh, to the uh, geoeconomic fragmentation uh, point. Uh, very quickly, uh, the emergence of, um, of uh, industrial policy as uh, a new policy tool for uh, climate uh, policy. I mean, until very recently, and even now, most, uh, let's say, multilateral institutions uh, are advocating for carbon prices, carbon markets, etc. So uh, certainly from the World Bank side, this is still also the main, uh, the main message. But uh, these messages are facing a new reality, which is that no, uh, of course, carbon prices are covering more and more regions of the world. Uh, either taxes or, or, or uh, markets, but uh, the prices are, are relatively low, except in Europe, and uh, there is no clear sign that this is what's uh, really uh, making the new sectors uh, uh, emerge for the transition. So that's, and the, the clear message is that it's, it's actually something else that, that makes those new sectors emerge. Um, so you have different reactions to that. Um, the EU uh, has come last in this uh, in the sphere of industrial policy, and it's just really starting to uh, to see what what it means, uh, because it has it had from its uh, origins a very much a market ap approach to uh, uh, to climate policy. This very uh, now uh, well uh, uh, built uh, EU ETS system and very much willing to protect now this uh, uh, EU ETS system with a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, so th this is, in a way, a, a non-cooperative move as well. So uh, you can say that it's good because it creates uh, more, a faster adoption of those technologies and a reduction of costs, this industrial policies. But at the same time, because it, it also um, creates the new supply chains in specific regions, it excludes others from um, from the new, uh, new, uh, 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 let's say, green growth sources, if you want. Um, so, if you look at the effect of the carbon border adjustment mechanism of the the EU, uh, and uh, on the five sectors that that are covered by the by the CBAM, you can see that four countries uh, that have relatively similar emission intensity for that specific technology. So here you have, on the x-axis, you have the emission intensity uh, for aluminum, cement, electricity, fertilizers, and iron and steel. And what's in, uh, in blue is the EU countries. So you have the, the, the average, uh, the, the, the distribution of, of, of emission intensity uh, uh, by EU countries and the distribution of emission intensity for the same technology for non-EU countries. So uh, in this sector, for example, iron and steel, you see that the distribution is quite similar. So you could argue that CBAM will uh, basically uh, have not, not much of an effect on, um, uh, on the, re the trade relation between, uh, uh, between the EU and the non-EU countries uh, for, uh, uh, for that specific sector, <coughs> except that maybe there, there will be an incentive for everyone to improve uh, the, the the emission t intensity, but for those with very different distribution of emission intensity, then the effect could be very different in a way where the non-EU countries would really look for new partners, alternative partners than uh, the European Union, and redefine in a way uh, trade routes uh, if they can, or, uh, or 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 face very difficult. Uh, uh, times uh, exporting the same uh, uh, the same product, so you have depending on the the structural characteristics uh, of the technologies technology by technology, you can have very different 
uh, cross-border effects of uh, policies such as the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Okay, I'll, I'll be uh, very quick uh, on, on that one because uh, I think that was, of course, more of an issue when we, when we were in the middle of the, the, inf the, the high inflation phase, but I think that the argument still very much holds in the sense that a high high speed uh, decarbonization, which is all we want, uh, will probably generate uh, uh, high inflation uh, uh, moments or periods because of, uh, from the supply side. And so it, in a way we've, we've, we've uh, created a memory of how to react to uh, supply side inflation. Uh, at least there was a debate around that uh, with uh, ideas like uh, control of prices uh, for essential uh, um, goods uh, or more strategic, uh, um, well, strategic price controls, yes. And so this, this is a useful debate in a way that we can apply uh, in the near future if and when there is a, a, a more ambitious uh, transition uh, that, that, that's put in place. Okay, the last, last one is kind of obvious. We were two days ago in the middle of uh, like two hurricanes, one, uh, one, uh, one on the Euro European shore and, and the other one uh, in, the, in Florida. Um, and that actually has an effect also on the transition dynamics itself. So we can't consider separately mitigation and let's say adaptation or, or climate impacts. And you see here for uh, different types of um, uh, energy sources and the, renewa the renew renewable ones, how they are, uh, how sensitive they are to temperature increase, precipitation, sea level rise, uh, high, uh, high speed uh, winds and, and, and wildfires. And so your, the, the transition may, is becoming only more difficult uh, when a climate impacts are exacerbated. Okay, so that led us to, uh, that led us to uh, define this notion of mid-transition period. So as I said, in the IPCC, you see this very uh, um, uh, smooth uh, scenarios, uh, which tell you, uh, okay, we, are, we, we, we emit so much now, we need to move to net zero. Uh, that's uh, the different path, uh, how, you, uh, how you could make, make it, but w without acknowledging the, the difficulties that you face here. Right, and that's uh, and, and and what we think what we propose in this paper is to think about this period very specifically, and uh, and suggest that to to really list all these feedback loops that could backfire on your intentions to do the transition or to accelerate the transition, and consider uh, a whole spectrum of policies that would need to be mobilized to go through that uh, uh, very difficult period when you have basically two systems that coexist and that contradict each other and at the same time uh, some of the uh, climate impacts uh, that's, uh, that uh, starts uh, unfolding. Uh, so now what I wanted to uh, say, I wanted to move to uh, two, let's say, examples or two uh, focus. Okay, one is taking a bit of a broader uh, um, approach, so taking not just the climate issue, but the planetary boundaries framework, and look at uh, how much countries are uh, contributing to, uh, or how much the trade between countries, so this cross-border dimension again, is contributing to uh, uh, planetary boundaries. So I guess you all know more or less uh, about planetary boundaries, so I don't have to, uh, to repeat uh, all this, but like six of the nine boundaries are transgressed. I think there is seven, one, seventh, that's almost there. Um, and what's interesting, let's say here, is that by taking a country level approach and looking at the, the trade between countries, uh, you can better appreciate how uh, countries are positioned in their contribution uh, to uh, the different dimensions of the planetary boundaries. And actually, of course, you would expect some kind of north-south uh, 
dimension to it or uh, opposition if you want but you have a picture that is a bit more complex uh, than that even if that's cl a clear trend but that that's also there's a there's more more to that let's say um, so that's the goal uh, of the draft paper that, that was shared I think to, to all of you uh, which is to understand the pressures exited by global trade uh, over the planetary boundaries um, and find which countries and economic activities uh, lead uh, the pressure over each one of those planetary boundaries. So by the way, this, this work has been done with uh, two uh, colleagues, uh, Guillermo Magacho, uh, who was with us uh, uh, half an hour ago, uh, and Gabriel uh, Carnero, who is a former student from uh, EPOG, I think. So you may know him. Um, and so, uh, Previous research on, on, on planetary boundaries is uh, usually at, has been done usually at the global level. So you have these regular reports on where we are in the in the landscape of uh, planetary boundaries, and and now more and more you have these country exercises as well. So for example, an ex exercise on Chile, looking at how Chile contributes to planetary boundaries. There's some some on France actually that uh, was done by uh, Adem um, and and, uh, and and some. Uh, um, scientists and this is this appears more and more but there, there's not so much on the how the relation between countries uh, uh, is um, uh, contributes to uh, these planetary boundaries so we basically use uh, uh, a, meth a method that uh, where we measure the pressure on uh, of trade on planet on the different dimensions of planetary boundaries using a, a multi-regional input-output uh, database, Gloria, which, and we were lucky uh, about that, has almost all the proxies we, we can find for all the dimensions of the planetary boundaries. So we use it just for the year 2021, um, which maybe is uh, uh, a kind of bias in a way, but you can consider also that MRIO are uh, very much uh, giving the structural uh, aspects of uh, the structural uh, aspects of the the, 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 the demand uh, in, uh, across countries, and so that doesn't change so fast, right? So it could, should give a good indication of uh, uh, this uh, country sector um, uh, impact on planetary boundaries. Um, let me show first this uh, how we measure planetary boundaries in the paper so this is how it is measured across the the dimension that's that are already crossed uh, in the original uh, papers so the, the proxies that are used by the the team uh, around the uh, rockstrom and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the peak uh, peak potsdam and this is how it is proxy proxied in our paper so it's r a reduced form a reduced form version of, of planetary boundaries, but it's still quite uh, uh, quite good uh, in the sense that it can cover most uh, most aspects. Oops. So first, uh, for first way to look at the results it is to understand uh, how much trade contributes at an aggregate level across the different uh, planetary boundaries. So you have here in yellow the not traded part of the planetary bound uh, of the uh, uh, planetary boundaries pressure. So you see that the trade only represents, on average, around 20 percent. Here, more for the novel entities, around uh, 50 percent. Um, but why? So why do we focus so much on trade, right? <laughs> because trade uh, 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 determines not only the relation between countries, but usually uh, trade itself has a structural impact on how countries produce themselves within the country. So it's, it's much more than just trade, uh, uh, trade in goods that, explain, that, that is explained uh, by trade. So now we focus on those 20%, and we look at the uh, share of planetary boundaries pressure exerted by different income groups. So you have low-income countries, orange, medium-income countries, uh, kind of blue and uh, high-income countries in, in uh, green. And you have the different planetary boundaries here. So 
Not too much of a surprise here, at least for the first ones where high-income countries and medium-income countries represent the, the bulk of the, um, of the, the pressure uh, on planetary boundaries. But uh, a bit of a different picture here with water stress, climate change, and novel entities, where we, th we see high-income countries really uh, uh, moving up in terms of the responsibility uh, on planetary boundaries through uh, trade. Another, another way, a nice way to see it is to look at uh, the planetary, planetary boundaries pressures between different regions of the world. And we take here just the biochemical flows uh, planetary boundary. And okay, this is beautif this beautiful colors, but what it shows is basically that <coughs> you have the Latin American region, which uh, has the uh, uh, biggest uh, export footprint on planetary boundaries, if you look at exports. But where does it export? It exports to, to uh, uh, East Asia and the Pacific region, M, metal income. So China is there. Um, and then you have the ECA region, right? So East, uh, Europe, uh, Central Asia. And so you have a different story here that's that, that comes from the import side, right? You see that um, the, the region which has the, the most uh, uh, impact on uh, planetary uh, boundaries from an import point of view is the East Asia Pacific region and then the, the Europe and Central Asia. And so we have those graphs for all of the planetary boundaries and with quite different stories depending on the type of planetary boundary that you consider, which is not so much of a surprise because behind each one of those planetary boundary you have actually different sectors that contribute to uh, those planetary boundaries. So, and each region of the world has more or less uh, uh, specialities in those uh, uh, in those sectors. Okay, last uh, way I think to, to look at it and it's um, to look at to bring together this import and export story. So let's, for example, I don't know, take a look at this one. So you have East Asia Pacific high income. And you have all the planetary boundaries there. And in blue, you have the import story. In yellow, the export story. So you see that East Asian Pacific uh, imports, uh, has, a, has, a, has an import side footprint on the, uh, planetary boundaries on the biodiversity and land, land use access. And an ex export food, uh, footprint on planetary boundaries, like quite well distributed across the different uh, planetary boundaries. So this is a way to qualify um, a bit more geographically um, this cross-border, uh, let's say, exchange of planetary uh, uh, boundaries foot footprints. So this is still, we are using this kind of framework of uh, um, looking, focusing on the cross-border effects of, um, of the environmental transition or the, the change in the uh, uh, global environment and we're qualifying across different regions and across the uh, different planetary boundaries. Let me move. I don't know how much time I still have. Good, I think I should finish on time. So let me move to the second example. So again, we are focusing on this cross-border dimension, which we think is crucial to understand the dynamics of this mid-transition period. And we look into uh, the question of critical minerals in the transition. So just to uh, give you a, a bit of a general framework. You can consider that the, 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 the transition, so we are back to the climate aspect again. The, transi the transition will generate uh, uh, changes, uh, abrupt changes between these different categories of countries. Uh, if you simplify a lot, you have fossil exporters, you have importers of green uh, technologies, you have ex exporters of critical minerals, uh, you have exporters of uh, uh, green technologies and fossil importers. Okay, no country is purely one of those things, uh, maybe except Saudi Arabia for the uh, uh, fossil exports uh, country, or uh, yeah. But all of them are a bit of a mix of that. But if you want to simplify and and and, and understand uh, the issues, you can you can look at that graph. Then, what we're doing here is take the G20 countries and try to place them in that 
in that space, right? Uh, so we have here on the x-axis uh, a kind of indicator of, of uh, uh, dependence on fossil uh, fossil exports. That's the x-axis. The y-axis is uh, a measure of net exports of, of critical minerals. And then the color of the points, the color of the dots, um, shows how uh, close the country is to develop new, the new uh, emerging new uh, green sectors. So it's an indicator of uh, green, uh, it's a green complexity index that you may know uh, already about, right? So of course, if you're red, you don't have a, a very high green complexity index. If you're uh, green, you have a high uh, green complexity index. So when you consider th in with these three dimensions, we, we can measure more or less the, those, those five uh, archetypes of countries. Uh, and so you see Saudi Arabia here, uh, really far on the, on the, on the index of uh, fossil uh, uh, dependency. Uh, Russia a bit middle of uh, the road here, and South Africa quite high on uh, the next net exports of critical minerals. And then a group of countries here, which are like more neutral on those two dimensions, but have different uh, uh, levels of, of uh, technical uh, uh, capabilities in terms of the new uh, emerging uh, sectors. So one question uh, here is how the, in, in, uh, specifically the critical mineral dimension will change um, the relations between countries, or could change uh, the relations between countries. Um, so, sorry, I'm switching to French. Uh, French. I didn't have the the time to uh, to re uh, to rewrite the slides uh, in 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 English uh, uh, quickly. But uh, let me uh, I'll do it uh, in English myself. So, uh, I don't I don't think you ne necessarily need. Um, a good introduction to critical minerals and their role in the in the transition, right? So I will I will switch to the key key graphs that you can uh, uh, grasp. So first, this um, this graph shows the extraction of mineral resources uh, from the 70s to uh, almost today, and compare that with a global uh, GDP. So it just says that. Uh, we have never uh, experienced such a high level of uh, resource extraction, and this doesn't doesn't seem to change much with the uh, uh, with the transition. On the quite on the contrary, uh, in effect, we need lots of different uh, minerals to build uh, batteries. Uh, here, it's cell phones uh, to build uh, wind turbines. Um, and you have here a, a kind of summary list for solar, wind, hydro, bioenergy, etc., of the different minerals that are needed uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to develop those uh, sectors. Um, so uh, there is a recent push, relatively recent push, to better understand um, how that could affect the dynamics of the transition, the geo-economic uh, e fragmentation as well. So we have essentially the International a Energy a Agency that has starting to shift towards an uh, uh, international uh, critical mineral uh, agency, almost, uh, like issuing many, many reports on, on the topic. The World Bank also has uh, um, uh, an important report in 2020 uh, on, the, on the issue, trying to first see which, which are those critical minerals exactly. And they are not defined in, in uh, um, geological terms. It's not; they are not like rare earth uh, metals. Uh, they are def defined because of the, their uh, their needs, their demand for these new uh, sectors and these new technologies. Um, yeah. So uh, any scenario uh, of uh, the future transition shows. Uh, skyrocketing, skyrocketing needs of uh, many of those um, uh, uh, minerals. The simulations are very different from one exercise to another, but basically there are some very worrying um, uh, trends compared to the current capacity to uh, uh, extract uh, or even uh, um, 
uh, given the reserves that we can observe on some of those minerals. So that, that's a 2021 report by uh, the International Energy a Agency that shows, uh, depending on the transition scenario that you, you take into account, that you will have a two-fold or four-fold increase um, uh, of the, the need uh, of, the, of those critical minerals and, and, uh, and what, where, the, where the demand uh, will come from. Uh, this one is quite nice, actually, if you like, uh, like to see long, long history, right? So you start in 4,000 before Christmas, uh, before Christmas, before, <laughs> before Christ, and uh, you, uh, you end up in 2050. And so that's the, the kind of geo geological period we, we, we will be in, in the coming years, or we are already. And so uh, in 22 years alone, if we, if we uh, believe in the projections uh, for the transition, uh, we will be extracting uh, more than anything that has been mined basically in human uh, history. Uh, okay, so that, that has some effects uh, on prices. So we're back to the uh, inflation, uh, uh, supply-driven inflation uh, feedback loop. Y you can see that uh, since the 2019, so a bit of COVID-related, a bit of Ukraine uh, war-related, uh, but not only that, you have more variability, at least in the prices of uh, uh, many critical minerals, and on average, an, uh, an, in an increase. Uh, you had a very steep increase in 22. That's like um, is now a bit lower, but not coming back to the uh, to the previous levels. Uh, you have some projections that exist from the IMF uh, that that tries to look at the Im potential impact on prices of net zero uh, policies on copper, nickel, cobalt, and, and lithium. And in red, you have this net zero uh, scenario, um, a median of the, uh, the different uh, uh, transition scenarios t uh, taken in, uh, into account. Uh, and you see on average also uh, uh, an, uh, an important or noticeable impact on prices. Um, so that's a 2021 uh, study. Now what uh, now I will uh, show, I, I will focus on there's different types of risks that could emerge out of uh, um, this cr critical mineral story. There is the geo geo uh, geological risk. I, I won't speak about that. I'm not a specialist at all. But I will look at the different risks on geoeconomy and, uh, and environment. So uh, this is uh, a picture that, that gives you um, the, the, the share of uh, of the three top countries by uh, sector, so here are the fossil fuels for reference, and then critical minerals, right? Um, so uh, in total production for selected uh, minerals and fossil fuels in 2019, uh, uh, so that's like more for the extraction side, and that's for the processing, right? Which is an important uh, factor as well. So you see clearly from the com just the comparison between that picture and that one, or so that one on fossil fuels and that one on critical minerals, that the, the, the geography uh, is completely changing, right? Where you have a US, let's say US, Saudi Arabia, Russia based uh, a geography, uh, and then a much more diverse geography for critical minerals with some strong um, um, let's say strong uh, um, a representation of China, and here in processing, it's China overwhelmingly uh, uh, dominating the, the processing sector. Um, if you take the point of view of the European Union, there was a paper by Decote I 2024 uh, from the London School of Economics, where you can find this analysis of the dependency of the European Union to uh, global suppliers of critical minerals. Uh, and you see, of course, a strong dependency on China, Australia, and then a little bit less Russia, some uh, Latin American countries, and, and, the, and the US. 
Um, so this is a, a, a kind of study that all regions of the world are now doing and implementing policies to try to uh, strategize their um, how much they would need from which countries, etc. Uh, so it's often said that China has a very strong position, which is true. Um, you can um, so it, it, but but actually the, the the picture is a bit more complex than that. As we said, China is uh, dominating the the refining side, and only partially dominating a few of the uh, of the critical minerals. And then it depends on how you measure dominating. So that's what we were uh, willing to uh, investigate a bit more in that paper, which was how do we measure um, the ownership of the mines. And we have uh, basically different ways to measure that, the kind of geographic uh, way, so that's simply in which country is the mine located. So that's the left-hand side, so you have different critical minerals and you have the, the countries that are dominating in terms of purely geographical origin, uh, the mines. So China is there in, in, in red, but it's like not really everywhere. It's, you have Australia, you have Brazil, uh, you have South Africa Aust uh, and, 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 and others. Now you can also look at um, who owns the mine and where is that owner located? So that's the second measure of ownership. Um, so here you ha may have a little bit more of China, but you also have a very strong uh, South Africa. You have quite strong uh, Australia as well. So it's a different uh, geography that uh, that uh, you can uh, you can see. And then last point is who owns the owner? Uh, who has the uh, the shares uh, the, the the financial control over? the owner of the mine. And here you can see the US completely dominating uh, this uh, in, in purely financial ownership terms. Uh, only in the lanthanides you have China like dominating the, uh, the picture. So depending on the measures that you're, you're taking, you have a very different uh, view of potential geo geoeconomic uh, risk or geoeconomic fragmentation. So let me finish with um, uh, I think that's the last really interesting graph. We, 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 what we're trying to do there, there is to look at potential scenarios of geoeconomic fragmentation. So how do, how do you measure geoeconomic fragmentation? That's difficult. Uh, there are many ways to do it. We chose one, which is uh, how countries vote uh, in, the, in the UN, General Assembly, and how uh, far countries are one by one one against one, if you want, uh, on the votes in the uh, uh, UN General Assembly. So that defines um, a geopolitical distance. That's on, th on the X axis here, right? So uh, the farther you are uh, from uh, uh, on the right hand side, the, 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 the most geopolitical distance you have between countries owning that uh, kind of critical mineral, right? So let, let's take uh, uh, vanadium, for example. If you take the um, geographical ownership measure, uh, geographical concentration measure uh, of, of vanadium, or if you take uh, the legal origin uh, measure uh, uh, of concentration on the vanadium sector, or if you take the geographical uh, measure of vanadium, so you end up with quite different geopolitical uh, implications, right? When you have the when you have the three uh, points which are at the same place, that means that um, the three measures of concentration are quite homogeneous in terms of the geoeconomic fragmentation uh, uh, measure uh, scenario that you have. Once they are, when, when they are split, it means that actually you could have very different uh, uh, stories uh, coming out of a geoeconomic fragmentation depending on which ownership definition you uh, consider, right? So that's just what the, the graph says. Um, 
And yeah, I will I will stop here, I think, uh, just saying that, I mean, this is really uh, an important topic emerging more and more. And just this graph uh, proves it. You have the number of policies targeting critical minerals by country. And it starts in two th 2016. So we are here in 2024. So there, like, it's, it's almost uh, an exponential uh, growth in uh, policies focusing on critical minerals. And so there is need for more, uh, more studies on, on uh, what, what the impact could be and also what kind of policies could mitigate uh, those effects in the transition process. Thank you very much.